Hello and welcome to the next episode of Let's Talk Brand, uh, the first in Poland series of interviews with world-class branding uh, experts. And today I'm super excited to interview uh, Brenda Benz, who is now in uh, Singapore. Uh, Brenda is ranked number one of the world's top 30 branding experts. And this is going to be a long story. Maybe this is the short story, but it's still it's long uh, uh, story about, about you. And after earning uh, her MBA uh, from not any school, but from Harvard Business uh, School, uh, Brenda spent 20 years building billion dollar mega brands across four continents for Fortune 100 consumer giants. Uh, she then started her own global business, combining her uh, years of expertise in brand building along with her passion and experience in corporate uh, leadership. Uh, the outcome is Brenda's unique personal leadership branding system that is based on the same methods used by household name brands. Brenda wrote uh, 11 books and have won over 40 book awards. So most, most of your life you write books. <laughs> I, 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 I guess. Uh, earlier this year, her latest book, um, The Forgotten Choice, was released um, uh, to critical acclaim. Through her books, keynote addresses and corporate lane, learn, learning programs, uh, Brenda has helped hundreds of uh, thousands um, across the world uh, take control of their lives and, and careers and craft the future they want. So welcome to the podcast and actually welcome back to Poland, Brenda. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So actually, you, you are you are the first um, uh, world famous um, branding expert um, uh, who had contact uh, with Poland and companies in Poland. Um, you've been working in, in Warsaw, yes? Yes, I am. Right. Okay. How do you remember your your working time in Warsaw, and when exactly was it? And uh, okay, so I have. Yeah, I was there from early 1994 to late 1998 so almost five years about four and a half five years and you know it's funny i've been back to warsaw since since then uh, a few years ago and you would not recognize it it's amazing how the city is today and the country is today but back then you know Wukash, the, the country was in a state of transition right it was transitioning from former communism to capitalism it was dynamic it was changing so quickly i remember going into little mom and pop shops you know with very few goods and by the time i left five years later they were had the largest hypermarkets in all of eastern europe there in poland right the macros for example and it was incredible poland was the center of growth for central and eastern europe back then and in from a business standpoint new brands were being launched every month if not every week. It was incredible. And uh, roads were limited back then. You know, there was kind of like a two lane to post nine, if I remember correctly. And, you know, phone calls, you had to have a landline and it would cost $4.50 per minute <laughs> to, to get a phone call through. I waited to get a landline. It took months, you know, to install. And, you know, back then, very few people spoke English. So I learned to speak Polish and to write Polish and I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of language mistakes, but uh, but I have a lot of happy memories too because my husband, I met my husband there in a little church on Ulitsa Medyodoka. Really? Yep, yep. Wow. And uh, there's a love story. <laughs> it's a wonderful, yeah. We met him, uh, we met there. And so I remember wonderful things Wajinki Park and Chopin concerts and Villanov Palace and just wonderful, wonderful time. I have very fond memories of Poland. But how did you get this job in Poland? So I was with Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is the world headquarters. And I went there right after I got my MBA from business school and I wanted to go overseas. I really wanted to go overseas. And I kept telling them, I want to go overseas. I want to go overseas. I want to go overseas. And finally, one day they called me in and said, okay, you're going to Warsaw, Poland. 
<laughs> wow, okay. And uh, I, I, they were just starting up the organization. When I started there, 50 people, five zero people were working there. When I left, it was 1,200 people. So wow. it, it, had, it grew so rapidly. It was an amazing time to be in Poland, yeah, and to be with Procter & Gamble. Well, wonderful. Do you, do you remember any world in Polish? Any do words I, in Polish? Do you remember any words in Polish? Oh, um, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah, Actually, I do. I'll tell you one of funny stories. So, dziękuję, proszę bardzo. But I have to tell you some funny ones. Like, yeah. I got to the point where I would, get, I would get into a taxi and I would say, they would t speak to me and I would say, you move in Dobrze po polsku. Because I wanted to say, I don't speak Polish well, right? But because I could say that, that's the only thing I could say really, really, really well, they would didn't believe me. They thought that I could speak Polish, so they would keep speaking to me in Polish. But um, yeah, so now my husband and I, we still speak to each other sometimes in Polish. You know, smash well, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have a wonderful accent. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> that's great. And um, actually, that's, that. I think this was exciting to, to be in Poland in the 90s. <laughs> it really was. It, it was a quite a challenge, I think. I, I wonder what was your first thought when you knew that you are going to Poland to Warsaw to work there? Well, it wasn't exactly what I had thought, okay? I didn't know what to expect. And by the way, I moved there in the middle of the winter. When, you know, Polish winters can be harsh. And it was dark and it was so cold. I just remember it being so cold and I'm thinking, what have I done? But it was amazing. I, I loved the spirit of the Polish people. I loved the excitement of knowing that something big was growing there and that this was history in the making. It was an exciting time to be there. So I, we, I, have, I have really, really fond memories. Amazing time. So actually you are now the part of the Polish history. I know. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> yes, it is. Absolutely. Okay, Brenda, uh, you wrote that you are passionate about two things, and uh, branding and leadership, and uh, how the two work together. So, how they work together? <laughs> well, so the way I look at branding is, branding is for a company or branding for a person, we can talk about the difference, but branding is how you want people to perceive, think, and feel about you, about your brand, what have you, okay? So it's how you want people to perceive, think, and feel. Leadership then is how do you want people to perceive, think, and feel about you as a leader? And that's why I call it leadership personal branding. It's about you as an individual, as a leader, how do you want people to perceive, think, and feel about you? That's what's foundational. Okay. Yeah. So actually, do we, we all have brands. And actually, exactly. mm -hmm. with this definition, I do understand that we have to focus on something. Uh, if brand is what other people feel, think uh, about us, so we should try to focus on something. And I see the entrepreneurs, they, they struggle to, to find the right word or the right sentence um, and they try to focus on something but there's a lot of problems with that and how to do this well actually is there any tip an yeah. idea a simple yeah. one well here's the thing uh, remember i came from the branding world where i i saw these principles applying to household goods you know i i ran the vizier brand back when, you know things like that in poland i know what it takes to build that brand and i apply that to people there's three simple, powerful steps. Number one, define your brand. What do you want it to stand for? I used to, I like a five words exercise. What are the five words you want people to perceive, think, and feel about you, for example? Keep it simple, five words. Define it. Secondly, how do you communicate your brand as a leader? So communicating through the way I act, through the way I react, through the way I look, through the way I sound, and honestly, through the way I think. The way we think drives the outcomes. It's an inside job first, right? So then that's the second step. Get clear on how to communicate it. And lastly, avoid damaging it. Stick to what you want your brand to stand for. Too many times we ruin brands because we fall short of what we want to stand for. So be consistent, consistent, consistent. Yeah. That's a simple, that's a simple version. <laughs> okay, I, I, I like to keep it simple because I actually now I work um, 
after my experience working with, with big companies, and mm -hmm. now I work with uh, startups and the small companies, helping uh, one, two person companies uh, building brands mm -hmm. and um, providing them easy ways to do this by themselves. So this is this is a wonderful tip. That's just yeah. five five simple words, and we have to choose one. But actually, this can cause a headache to find these five words and then to choose one. Well, here's what's important. So remember, I said your brand is the way you want others to perceive, think, and feel. The key to success as an entrepreneur, you need to focus on the others. What do they need from you? What do they need functionally? What do they need emotionally? Because if you want to real, build a really great brand, it's not just enough to deliver a functional outcome. You know, I'm going to deliver this service. I'm going to make this product. It's about having an emotional connection. And when you can make an emotional connection to a brand, you will build trust and loyalty in that brand. And that's when you use, a con that's when you gain a consistent user year after year after year. I mean, we've all had brands we love. We all have brands that we've used again and again and again. Guess what? Those are brands that are responding to an emotional need that we have. We may not even realize we have it, but they are. And those are the brands that will last and last and last. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what is the connection between personal brand or the employee brand and the company or corporate brand or the big brand? I don't know how, how you call this, but what is the connection between these two? Yeah, so each individual in, in the organization has a brand. They have a brand already, whether they realize it or not, right? It's the way others are perceiving, thinking, and feeling about them right now. So the question is, do you have the brand you want? And you can change that if you don't like the one you have. But the point of personal branding is, what do I stand for? How do people perceive, think, and feel about me? The company brand also has, how do consumers, the industry, other competitors perceive, think, and feel about that brand. How does that company want to be perceived, thought about, felt about? And how closely do those link? How closely do I, as an individual, embody and embrace what the company wants to stand for? And so you can really work on finding great synergies between personal brands and company brands. I call it the corporate brand, personal brand connection. How well those two mesh. Okay, so um, so this is the, the recruitment job that the employee brand fits to the big brand or corporate brand. That's right. Has the individual bought into the concept of the company brand? Do they believe in it? Can they embrace it? Will they be willing to embody that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the workplace. Um, it's actually it's the place where there is a specific uh, brand game. <laughs> the specific brand game takes place. Uh, so because the work, it, it, the company consists of thousands, hundreds, uh, micro brands. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let's let's go to the to the uh, to the leadership. How you call it? Leadership branding. Uh, there was this name. <laughs> Leadership personal branding. <laughs> Leadership personal branding. Okay, how actually do you know you are a good leader? How do uh, I know I am a good leader? <clears throat> well, good leaders change. Good leaders are situational leaders. So I, if what does it mean to be a good leader today? I think leading during the, you know, the coronavirus, the pandemic, is a very different leadership skill than leading during good times or leading during with a, if you're leading with a company that's failing or being challenged you need to be a certain way versus a lead, a company that's maybe not being challenged just really going great the day-to-day -day operations so good leadership is a varying thing it changes all the time you know sometimes you may need to be calm or strong forceful or empathetic it just depends on the situation. So leadership is fluid. I always say leadership is a journey without end. We never quite get there because it's just changing all the time. And we have to, so I guess the best leaders are situational leaders that can adapt to the particular situation, the environment, understand what the people need. 
in order to be those, uh, to, what others need in order to succeed. Did you have a good leader in Poland while working in Poland? Or you were oh, a leader? <laughs> I did, I did, I did. Thank you for asking. The general manager of Poland at that time was a fant fantastic guy. His um, name was Ian True. He was a wonderful man. I've learned so many great lessons from him. I was very fortunate. I had wonderful leaders in, in all of my career. I've had amazing leaders. And I think that makes a huge difference in how we develop as leaders ourselves. I always say like, just as we parent, we parent the way we say, well, I'm not going to be like my parents, but then we become like our parents, right? <laughs> we parent like our parents. I think it's true with leaders when you have really good leaders and you're following leaders, you will pick up their habits. The key is to watch for, if you have a bad leader, watch for it and recognize that is not what I'm going to do. That's not how I'm going to be and make sure that you don't follow that path. But I had great leaders. Yeah, great leaders. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, okay, so we have the, the leader who should understand his employees not only give them a job to do, but also understand how they live, what they need. And this is, this is not difficult when you have a small team. It's going to be difficult when you have uh, hundreds of people um, in your team. I, I, actually, I don't know, maybe maybe this is, this is the wrong thinking, uh, but how good leader can understand people need when there's so many people? Yeah, well, it's a great question. When you're a higher up in an organization, you're leaders of leaders of leaders of leaders, right? There's many and then leaders. under leaders, there are employees and employees. Eventually, yes. And so it's about creating the right, at that, at that high level, and I coach a lot of people at that high level, it's about creating the right vision. So people are really clear on what the vision is, where are we headed? It's about creating the right strategies so that people know how to get to where they want to go. It's about creating the right culture that can then trickle down. And culture, by the way, is just the way we act, react, look, and sound. That's what culture is. And I think of it as a soup. It's the broth. It's the liquid, right? It's the liquid in which we swim in the soup of work. And so we have to think about the culture we're creating. And then when that culture will trickle down, it, when you can create that from la la layer to layer to layer, and people are focused on vision, they're focused on strategy, they're all lined up in one direction, that's when magic happens. That's when magic happens, yeah. Okay, and that's the magic actually, because it seems very difficult to do this. Well, it doesn't have to be. I think the key okay. is we overthink things. I think we typically overthink it. When we really say, here's the, here's the answer. The key to success at leaders at the leader level is to be consistent. And you know, a lot of the CEOs will say to me, oh, I have to give another speech and I've said the same thing over and over and over. And I say, no, keep saying the same thing over and over and over. Because by the time it finally reaches down to the 5,000 employees, you want to make sure it is the exact same message you want them to hear. And you want to make sure your direct reports are sharing that same message and their direct reports are sharing that same message. And it is actually not as difficult as it sounds. It's about being really crystal clear and inspiring others to that same clarity. Okay. So why do we still have this, such a big problem with, um, with employee engagement? Mm -hmm. uh, because according to, to, to Gallup's website and the reports, um, uh, nearly 85% of um, employees worldwide uh, are still not engaged. So I understand they come to work to do their job and they go home and actually they are not happy. Uh, mm. I understand this because there is there is this always this reality uh, check. Uh, I just need to have a job. I just need to earn some money. Mm. I don't want to do this, but I need this money. So yeah. I'm going I there. I hear you. And I think it's one of the saddest things about work in our modern world is that we end up taking jobs. So I think there's two parts. One, we end up taking jobs that honestly, if we were really listening to our heart, our intuition, our I call it the inner coach, if we're really listening, we wouldn't probably take those positions. We feel societal pressure to take jobs that may or may not be really who we are or what we are. I think we lose track 
of who we are and what we are. And so people end up taking jobs and they hope that it will work out. But then when it doesn't, they're just dis they're disillusioned. They're frustrated. So I think one is making sure you really are going for positions that speak to you, that really address what who you are and what you want to be doing. So that's the input. I think the output is that leaders are not always most inspiring to their team members. You know, the variety of leadership that we have in today's world is quite quite wide, quite a wide range. So are we putting in place, are we helping leaders grow to be the type of leaders that are going to help people bring out the best in them? Do we know how to do that? And I think it really comes down, Lukash, to coaching. You know, coaching isn't what we do. Coaching is a mindset. Coaching is an, a, a, a form of uh, approach to thinking, how we think about leading others. And I think once we start to see more and more coaching in the workplace, people will bring those skill sets up. Leaders will make sure they're drawing that up. And you'll start to see real outcomes that change in terms of engaging people, engaging people. Yeah. So actually, should the recruiter uh, stop the employees that have wrong motivation to do the job or actually how to find this wrong motivation because actually i don't want to have in a company uh employee yeah. that is not going to be happy is not going to be engaged so yeah i think what happens honestly what i've often seen is that i uh, we don't get as crystal clear about what we typically do is get really clear about what we want that person in that job to do we're paying attention to the skills, the talents, the capabilities, what we need to do. What we aren't doing is paying enough attention to how we are being. Is it the right character for this type of, does this person have the right character for this type of position? Does this person have the right attitude towards what we're looking for? That's what I say, that personal brand, corporate brand connection can actually be not just the foundations of what we're going to be doing, but the foundations of how we are going to be being. And I think, I think we're moving more and more into that space now because people are just getting fed up of not being engaged. So I think this is going to change. I'm excited to see where it all heads. Okay, because because it seems it is a problem when you have a big rotation of, of, of employees um, when they are not happy. But, but, I still wonder because we, we have all this knowledge about how to be a good leader, how to build a company culture, how to recruit people. But still, when you think that only one, to, uh, only, I don't know, 15 to 20 percent of your employees are engaged, um, mm -hmm. only 15 to 20 percent of your employees, sooner or later, I think sooner, are going to be unhappy. And they are going to leave you, so mm -hmm. it uh, it can um, uh, it can just I don't know not destroy, but uh, it's not good for the brand. It's not good for the brand. It's not good for the company. It's not good for the person. It's not good for the leader. For the clients it's not, and the. It's not good for clients. It's not good for. That's my point. I mean, it really is. An, I suspect billions of dollars per year are lost on engagement, on lack of engagement. It doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. It's all about trying to find out needs. What do people need? And again, just like I mentioned, corporate brands or company brands, there's functional needs, emotional needs. People also have functional needs and emotional needs. And how do you make sure that each person is getting what they need? And you trickle that down through an organization and you end up with different results. You know? Okay. Yeah. So, but actually, I, I still, uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure that there is always going to be a lot of people that just need to earn some money because I have to pay my rent, mm -hmm. and, and um, I don't have time to choose uh, to check if I'm if this job is right for me, if I'm going to be happy there. Mm -hmm. I need this money right now, so I'm going in. So, how the, the good leader should work with such an em employee? Well, I really like to come up with a, a list of, okay, here, I like it called the top 10. The top 10 characteristics. So I have a list of the top 10 characteristics. And I say, these are the top 10 characteristics of what it takes to be successful in this position. Okay. And 
this is what I like to start with. For every, every position, what are the top 10 characteristics? What is it going to take to be successful? Then there's two things that happen. The person in them themselves does a one to 10 scoring. 10 is high, one is low. How do I self-assess myself on those 10 characteristics? Separately, the leader, the boss, does the same thing. How does that person stack up on a one to 10 scale against those 10 characteristics? Then it goes into an open conversation. Open conversation. Oh, you, you're an eight on that? Well, I think you're an eight on this too. Okay, that's great. Oh, you're a four on that. I think you're actually a, an, an eight on that. I think you're much better than you think. And you have a conversation. Maybe they think they're better at something than you do. It just opens up these conversations. These are the conversations that are not happening in the workplace. We're not doing enough of that. Really having open, honest, authentic conversations about skills. And it's not about you're good, you're bad, you're doing it right, you're doing it wrong. It's not that at all. What it is, is where do you want to be? This is what ideal looks like. How close are you? What are the two or three of these we could work on together and give you projects for and help you get better at so that you can actually move up that ladder on that one to 10 scale. And then honestly, Wukash, when you do this, people get motivated because people want to grow. They want to learn. They want to get better and develop. And this is their chance to do that when you give them something tangible to work on like that. And they get excited. I've seen it work. I know this works. We do it in our company too. I know it works. Yeah. And they have to know why they're doing what they do. So why I'm doing this? Not exactly. because I, I have to sell something, because I want to change someone's life. So this, there's a different perspective, and different motivation. Well, there's that. And then there's also, remember I said the very first thing, what's the vision? What am I here for? Why am I, what is this company that I'm a part of? What role do I play in the vision and the, in the, the future of that? People want, to, people want to get up in the morning and go to work knowing that they have a purpose that they serve an important purpose, yeah. Not that I'm going to work to call my client and trying to sell something. No, I'm going to work to change someone's life because of what I'm selling. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. I am on the right way to be a happy <laughs> employee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, um, let's go back to brand, uh, company or corporate. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, it doesn't matter if it's a small or a big company, uh, but I want to focus now on something bad. So uh, what are the mistakes entrepreneurs make? The most common mistakes um, in brand building. And there is a going to be a second, more positive question. So let's start with something, <laughs> something bad. There's many that I could share with. I'll just share a few. Um, okay. Number one is um, trying to be fancy with your brand name. Don't be fancy with your brand name. You know, uh, have a brand name, especially if you're starting out, come out with a brand name that people are going to understand what it means. When, when you do this, you don't have to spend as much money to communicate what you stand for. People will get it. Those are the key. Put your keywords in your brand name so that people are searching for your brand name, whether they realize it or not. So we often get too fancy with brand names. I, I find that today more than ever. So just keep your brand name so powerful that people will get it from the start, okay? So that's one of the key things. The second thing is we often don't check to make sure there's a need in the market and that we're meeting that need in the market with what we have to offer. We stick new products out there. We put new services out there and just hope that it's going to stick. Instead of doing the real research that's necessary to make sure that you've got something that people are going to want and that they're willing to pay for. It sounds so elementary, but I've met hundreds of entrepreneurs that don't do that. They just got this idea in their head and they think it's going to work and they get out there and then it doesn't work. So those are two key ones I see that I see quite frequently. Okay, so the first one is, sorry, sorry to disturb you. So the first one is keep it simple. So keep it simple. when you build, we build a brand, you have to focus with the name also. You have to keep it simple and understandable. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so I, I just, just to the second point, uh, how we can make this, uh, this research? Uh, can I do this by myself without paying a lot of money to the huge company? How to, do this, how to check? 
Absolutely. Listen, I was an entrepreneur too. I mean, I've, I have been an entrepreneur for the last 19 years. When, when we have new things to, to get out there, new products, we're doing research, but we're not spending a lot of money on it. You can grab people who are your target market and invite them to uh, uh, have a drink at sodas or whatever uh, and sit around a table and do a mini focus group, right? To talk to them about what you're thinking about, get their inputs. <clears throat> when you're ready, you can go on to, there's so many things today like Survey Monkey, Pick a few. You can go on and do A/B testing really easily. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. So there are lots of ways to do testing today. I think easier than ever. And you can identify. You know, for a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, you can get an entire outcome of testing online from people all around the world. Or you can choose a specific location. It's so much easier today than it's ever been to get that kind of research. So you can do a book qualitative in person with focus groups, little mini focus groups. You don't have to pay them. You just have them show up, buy them dinner, whatever. And secondly is to, again, do, do it online. There's so much online today that we can use. It's really easy. You have social media. You have groups on Facebook and you can just social ask people and just to check on one, two, three, four, five people how it works. Okay, sorry, I disturbed you. <laughs> so there, we were talking about um, uh, talking about um, uh, mistakes. Well, let me just add, yeah, let me just add one more. Uh, which okay, I think is really important, and that is make sure. And it sounds again so obvious, but make sure that what you are proposing you're going to do with this business that you have is something that you love you are passionate about because you're going to be doing it morning, noon, and night for days and weeks and months and years on end if things go well. And when you are, when things dip and they may with an entrepreneurial environment, knowing that you're doing what you love will help you get through that dip. So when you know what you, when you know that you love it, when you're passionate about it, it just gets you through those tough times because that's that purpose that you have. Make sure that what you're doing is not just something you think you can make money from, that it's something that really speaks to you. Okay, so simple name, do the research and do what you love actually. Yep, exactly. You know, people mock that. They say, oh yeah, that whole do what you love. I think it's foundational. When you do what you love, you never work. You've heard that. But when you do what you love, the money comes. That's what's interesting. Because you're in the right mindset, you're in the right space to bring it to you. I think it's a fascinating process. But when you are doing what you love and you're on fire with it, money comes. It's really uh, an interesting. It's really interesting to watch. I've seen that happen with many, many, many entrepreneurs. Because if you have a good energy, you are authentic. Yeah, you're authentic. Because people you're people feel it. People feel it. That's right. You're inspired, and when you are inspired. You will be inspiring to others. And when you believe in what you're selling, what you're marketing, what you're offering, people know it and they'll buy into that. They'll buy into that. Yeah. People feel that you want to earn, just earn money. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We are now in a quite difficult situation because of the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wonder what positive uh, changes uh, this, uh, this pandemic has brought to, to us mm -hmm. as an ent entrepreneurs. Yeah. Is there well, anything positive from your I point actually, of view? Well, it's a great question because I actually think it's easy to look at it negatively. But I would actually honestly argue that there has been a lot of positive come out of this. Um, I think people are spending more. To, well, so let's look at it personally and professionally. Personally, I think people are spending more quality time with their families. Uh, I have I have leaders that are telling me they're having three meals a day with their children for the first time in years because they were always on the road and traveling and working, and so that's nice. I think people are taking care. But in general, taking better care of themselves. They're eating healthier because they're eating at home. They're not, you know, dining out and all those types of things that where the food may not have been as good. They're getting better sleep because they don't have the long commutes to the office, for example, if they're working from home. So there's been some interestingly, surprisingly interesting positive things come out of this from a personal level. I think from a business level, wow, I mean, it has brought to the forefront the importance of mental and emotional well-being. I'm coaching people regularly right now about 
how to have conversations in the workplace about people's mental and emotional well-being. We've never talked about that in the workplace, but it's becoming paramount. The impact on productivity is extraordinary if we don't, if we don't nail this, if we're not careful with that. And I also think in many ways for entrepreneurs, for leaders, it is stretching us. It's stretching us to new heights, to new challenges. And I think we're all learning to adapt. We're all learning. I think we're also recognizing that we can be far more resilient than we thought we could. So I think all of those things are good. I think it's setting us up for a really exciting and interesting future of where we're heading next. But actually, we do not know what the future is going to be because of the situation. So it's quite, quite stressful. Well, it can be, but it depends on how you use this time, Wukash. Let me give an example. I say, I'm, I consider this a pandemic as like, you're in a swamp, you're in a lake, right? The water has been drained and suddenly the rocks are showing. The rocks are showing in every company, every company rocks are showing. So if the rocks are showing, this is your chance to clean out the rocks. This is your chance to get rid of those rocks. What can you use? How can you use this time right now to improve your systems, improve your processes, make sure that your people are being trained to get ready for where we're heading next, whatever that might be. Uh, refresh your vision, refresh your, uh, um, your purpose as your company's purpose changed. All of this is perfect time to do this. I really believe that. So this is an opportunity. We can look at this as a negative or we can look at this as an opportunity. I'm choosing to look at it as an incredible opportunity. And the best leaders I have seen and I work with are doing the same. Yeah. <laughs> if there was no pandemic coronavirus, there would be no this discussion. There would be no video cast. Let's talk brand. <laughs> well, you know what? I was thinking the other day, uh, I was thinking I used to sit at the the feet of my grandparents and I would ask them what was World War II like and 20 years from now people are going to ask us the same thing how are we using this time right now they're going to ask us hey what was it like during COVID-19 and what are you going to say what are you going to say to your children to your grandchildren what are you going to tell them about how you use this time anyway this is because you've said this is a good time for the families because finally they can spend time together. But for some families, I, I know because my brother is a doctor and his wife is also a doctor. And this was strange for them because they've never uh, been in the same apartment for the, such a long time together. And it was, it was stressful because this was something absolutely new. We've never been together. Yeah, I hear you. I know, I know. <laughs> I think in certain countries, the divorce rate has gone up. But here's the yes. thing. But here's the thing, isn't that helpful? Wouldn't you rather know that this person isn't the person you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with than just because you don't see each other enough, you kind of ignore that? I mean, like I said, the swamp's been drained. The rocks are showing. It's time to clear out the rocks. If it's not a happy existence, this is your time to change and make things happy. Yeah. And Cheap we are back on the, on the positive tracks, <laughs> 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 on opportunity tracks. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, actually, th th this could be the last question, but I, I, I really wonder what's your new book. This is the 11th book, The Forgotten Choice. Yes. Yeah, it is. So what's, what's your new book about? So, Wukash, you know, and this book came out during this unprecedented time of uncertainty and it, it's perfect timing, actually, because the world, I always say when the world outside is in a complete state of disruption, we've got to disrupt the one thing inside of us that can create real positive and sustainable change. And that's the way we think. And this comes from branding, because if you want to change brands, you've got to change the way people think. And it's the same for us. And at every moment, Wukash, we all have available to us a really simple yet powerful choice that we can use to shift us from where we are to where we want to be. We've always had this choice, Wukash, but most of us have forgotten it. And this book is, is uh, four years of work went into this book, many years of thinking about this book, but it walks you through not only what this powerful choice is, but how to keep it front and center in your mind to really achieve what you want in your career, in your relationships, your business, your finances. And so I help people shift easily out of a negative mindset. I help them face the unknown with an incredible sense of excitement and adventure because I really believe that's where we're heading. It's going to be a very exciting time. We're on the cusp of something quite new. And I help people get over these self-limiting beliefs. 
you know, self-limiting beliefs. We've got to reframe our mindset, feel more in charge of our future. So I've had the honor of teaching this to thousands of people around the world. And so I'm really excited to get the book out there. Um, lots of fun, real life examples on the impact of putting this in action, into action. So you really, you know, here's the point. You can create the life, the business, the work that you want. It's a lot easier than you think. We overthink it and we make it too difficult. <laughs> okay. That's a wonderful last uh, word or last last um, uh, uh, sentence. Um, Brenda, thank you so much. It was really an honor for me to, to have you here. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with Polish entrepreneurs, marketers, and students as well. Um, um, it was a really pleasure to have you here. But uh, tell me, uh, where? please invite people to your channels. Where can we follow you? Sure, yeah. Oh, please. And do connect, because I love to stay connected. Social media, I mean, LinkedIn. Come uh, Facebook, Twitter, Insta, all those. All my blog posts, I blog quite regularly. Uh, my newsletter, come to my website, brendabents.com. I love staying in touch. So it's a great chance for us all to connect. And, and uh, yeah, and The Forgotten Choice is available on all sorts of book outlets. So feel free to help yourself to that. Uh, I would be delighted to connect with readers as well. Wonderful. Actually, thank you. Thank you also for being um, um, part of the Polish branding revolution, which actually you've started this in 90s. <laughs> we are continuing this. Honor, a complete honor to be. I loved, I loved Poland. I have such fond memories. So when you reached out, I was like, yes, we're going to talk with Lukasz. You bet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda, for your time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. All the very best.